I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books is pleased to host a conversation with legendary, legendary Julie Andrews and award-winning writer Emma Walton Hamilton, authors of The First Notes, the story of Do Re Mi. This book introduces readers to the remarkable story of the development of written music and speaks to the beauty of music and the power of perseverance. Well, now it's time to meet the authors. Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews' legendary career encompasses the Broadway and London stages, as well as multiple films, television shows, album releases, concert tours, directing assignments, and the world of children's publishing. She was married to film director Blake Edwards for 41 years, and the couple have five children, 10 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. Her co-author is her daughter, Emma Walton Hamilton, who is an award-winning writer, producer, and arts educator. Together, the, her mother, Julie Andrews, and her have written over 30 books for children and young adults, including the New York Times best-selling Very Fairy Princess series. Emma is on the faculty of Stony Brook University's MFA in Creative Writing. It is my extraordinary pleasure to welcome Julie Andrews and Emma Walton Hamilton. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Thank you for that lovely introduction. Oh, well, it is such a pleasure to have both of you today here to discuss this amazing book as someone who's loved music my whole life. Um, I was so thrilled to see this book and also excited because I, I thought it was a perfect holiday gift. Um, so uh -huh. could we start by summarizing? Tell me, for someone who hasn't yet read your book, what is it about? Shall I take that one? Why don't you? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, the first notes is uh, the true story mm. of a, a very, very wise monk who lived a thousand years ago and who was the first person to figure out how to teach music by reading and writing it. Um, before his time, the only way that people could learn music was to listen to it and to remember it by and to ear. pass it on, yes. And of course, that made things very difficult for people because they didn't always remember it exactly the way they'd heard it and <laughs> changed over time. <laughs> yes. Um, and Guido, this this very wonderful monk, figured out a way to write music and teach it to others so that it could be read. And um, from there, um, he created what we know as the solfege, which is the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti musical scale. And that, of course, as you may know, is, is the root of a very famous song. And also the way we think of write music today or sing, sing music yeah. today, this, those same syllables apply so, all these years. Because it was a, he lived a thousand years or more ago. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's so incredible. Um, when I first saw your book, it was hard to see the cover illustration and not think of the sound of music. I never, I never connected. Isn't that stupid of me? <laughs> I, mean, I connected with the song, but I didn't connect with the uh, running across the hill running across the hill song. No. Could you, um, in your end notes, and well, then we're going to get into the, the the book. But in the end notes, you have a beautiful note about Rogers and. Hammerstein, and can you talk about the importance of the Do Re Mi song and their work overall? Can you share oh, my with me? me? That would be easy. They were really the grand masters of, of musical theater and uh, wrote many, many beautiful musicals. Like, um, apart from The Sound of Music, they wrote Oklahoma, The King and I, Carousel, um, South Pacific, South Pacific and, and many, many others. And one wonders whether they knew about Guido when in the film, The Sound of Music, which I was fortunate enough to be in, uh, they wrote a song called Do Re Mi. And I'm wondering if they did know Guido's story. A number of people don't know that story, including me. I didn't know it when we began writing. We're always surprised at uh, how many people who are music scholars or musicians 
aren't actually familiar with the story <laughs> of how Guido came to invent musical notation and the do re mi scale. Yeah. So uh, it felt, it, given Mom's connection to the song and the film and Rogers and Hammerstein, it felt like a natural choice for us to write it, it, it just linked together so seamlessly. And it, it, since it had not really been written about, I think a long, long time ago, somebody did one book about it, but nothing for years. And it seems too important to not talk about. Because I, for one, many times thought, I wonder how did the written music begin. Also, of course, in those days when Guido wrote, they didn't have paper, they only had parchment right. and things like that. Um, so I, I don't know if I can go get any further without telling you that recently last week, I realized that everything I think I need to know, I've learned from a children's book recently. Um, really? And this being one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> what else have you learned? I'm fascinated now. <laughs> so Tell me, obviously, you found out about this story, but what inspired you to write this book and why now? Oh, my. Well, we, we first learned about Guido from my son's music teacher, believe it or not. Um, she, yeah, she just she casually was, mentioned it. Yeah, she was over at our house. She had been giving him a, a guitar lesson. And she said, you know, the, the do, re, mi, solfege was actually invented by this monk a thousand years ago. And <laughs> we were fascinated. And she told us a little bit about what she knew about him. And it stayed with us. And uh, we kept thinking, boy, it would be great to try and find out more. And, and maybe once tell that we started researching, day. there was the most enormous amount of information, if you care to look for it. And we looked and looked and we merged with them some people in his area and with the Abbey itself that we refer to. Uh, everybody was wonderfully kind and our marvelous illustrator, Chiara Fidele, is Italian and went to the Abbey and did her research as well. So it, it was a very happy um, job to, to put it all together. And we did a lot of things like um, the life of a Benedictine monk and what it was like in those days. And uh, of course, that's, they, those university, that those monasteries were like the universities in the old days. I mean, there weren't universities, but it was the best place to get a decent education. So I have a personal love of old books. And mm. so I'm wondering if you got to either touch a piece of parchment that Guido maybe touched or um, see an old published book. Because I know that his book was one of the most copied um, books on music it, during the the Middle Ages. I mean, it's tremendously important. And here's this person. Well, it, 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 all his research and findings went all across Europe. And in fact, he uh, was asked to go to Rome by the Pope, which is the peak of our story, because at the beginning he was laughed at by the monks and so on, uh, and said, you know, better that you stick to your prayers. And, and that seems a little uh, crazy what you're suggesting. And eventually it went all the way across Europe and then came over to, to America. And it's the way it was today. But in answer to your question, alas, we did not get to see any wonderful ancient books. Much the only as we one was the hand, which we happened to look at. Yeah, but we we wrote this book, of course, um, during COVID, and mm -hmm. that limited how much we were able to travel and how much uh, material we were able to actually physically access. So we had to rely on a tremendous amount of research through communication with uh, Middle East, Middle East, Sorry, through communication with medieval scholars in Italy and, um, and of course, through the Internet and through the library system and, and so forth. And also, um, we did an awful lot of research online, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Great fun to keep finding things. Yeah. Seems like it could be a good field trip uh, going to. <laughs> well, I wouldn't well, mind. <laughs> it, at any other time, we, it would have been a wonderful excuse for a trip to Italy. But alas, oh. we, uh, we had to leave that part to our beautiful Italian illustrator. So we're talking about research. Uh, the book mentions that Guido worked in monas the monastery's library. There's actually a beautiful spread that you've included. Um, <laughs> how did you discover this fact? And then um, he has this room in the middle, right? 
Yeah. Well, we discovered this fact, actually, um, at the back of the book, there is a, a sort of a rundown of the historic facts that are known about Guido. And uh, of course, we incorporated all of those. We also took some uh, poetic liberties and made some ass um, assumptions based on the work that we did with these med medieval scholars who told us what a day in the life of a young monk in those days would have been like. Um, so we don't actually have definitive evidence that Guido worked in the library at Pomposa, but we are 99.9% .9 sure that he would have because that is the job that would have been given to the young novitiates or the, the young monks entering yeah, I thought uh, it the was monastery pretty, pretty in those days. Known that he worked in the library. But well, yeah. all young monks did. did. That's so the job. They, were, they, yeah, they either yeah. worked in the libraries or they worked in the farm fields. And, Both uh, and because Guido yeah. was scholarly, and because he was passionate about music and words, um, we, we can fairly safely assume that he yeah. worked in the library and not in the farm field. And eventually he moved to another wonderful uh, cathedral, didn't he? That's right, where, when he became a teacher. When he became a teacher and he taught the choir in the, in what, what was the village again? The, uh, the town? Arezzo. Arezzo, that's right. And that's why he's called Guido d'Arezzo. Mm -hmm. So your story, while it's on, it's on music, written music, music notation, it's really about this young man with an idea and a passion for music. That's exactly. And as it mentions Guido, there is only, right, there are six basic tones that he discovers. And you've discussed it a little bit, solfege. Mm -hmm. um, the book also says that it, it took the first syllable from each of his favorite from his favorite hymn, um, from each line, and I and I was wondering, is this fact or is this what you thought? No, this no, is no, fact. this is true. Okay. This is fact. Um, we do know for a fact that the the choice of do re mi fa sol la ti. In fact, in his day, it wasn't do; it was ut. Um, ut re mi, which is later very hard to rhyme down. if you're Rogers and Hammerstein and writing it wrong. Yeah. Or, uh, Ut. Foot, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he did He did create ut, re, mi, fa, so, la. And uh, those were, in fact, the first syllables of each line of a hymn. Which was his, his favorite, favorite hymn. Yeah. yeah. And that is how, and that hymn actually, line by line, progresses up the, what we now know as the musical scale. And so that was how he came up with the idea of taking the first syllable of each of those lines because they automatically progressed upwards following uh, the steps of the musical scale. And then many years later, T was added as the seventh. And, and, and Ut was changed to Dill. Do. I don't know who did that. We haven't, we don't know. Who we haven't that. found that one out yet. Maybe somebody can enlighten us. Maybe someone can. Um, so these are some of the changes that happened, but he also was very much known for his hand. Can you talk a little bit about the the importance of Guido? The Guido in the hand. Yeah. Yes. Well, in in his in Guido's time, as, as Mom mentioned earlier, there was no paper. Um, they they had no printed paper as we have today. And they right. wrote on parchment, which was made from animal skins, but that was very very expensive and very hard to come by. And so uh, so Guido yeah. devised a system of using his hand and the in particular the, the lines in the palm of his the life hand, line the heart line and then to represent lines the lines the of the musical staff yeah. so he would point to certain lines on his hand to indicate to his pupils which note he wanted them to sing and also i think line. there was a form of that before he actually began to write it all down yeah but he was he was the one who codified it for the first time yeah. and therefore they called it the guidonian hand after him so the beginning of the story, and we've talked about it a little bit, but Guido makes this exciting discovery. He realizes that the notes, you, he can notate them, he can write them. And he goes and shares it with his teachers who are disinterested and discouraging. And yet he shows this perseverance. I wanted to know from both of you, have you had a similar experience where you've been really excited about something and then kind of crushed, but then you have someone like this pivotal moment that is I've about two hours or something about yeah. every book we've ever written. You, you, there's some stumbling block somewhere or a rewrite in some way. And I think it's it's pretty it's a pretty common human experience to uh, you know to come up with an idea and be very enthusiastic about it, and then 
be oh, reminded that there's, yeah, there's a lot more work to do to yeah. actually make it happen. But it uh, is something we really love. She's the uh, nuts and bolts and firm uh, structure of a story, and I'm more the uh, the sort of uh, fantasy beginnings and ends of chapters and ends of the book and making a left turn or a right turn if we need to, something like that. Makes sense, and and it's a great balance. Too, it was a discovery balance, that we yeah. had that in it, that we did have those two. But I'm strengths. glad you brought that up because that is very much the point of the book, and and very much what we hope young readers yeah. will will take from the book is this idea that uh, you know it, it only takes one person, one young person with an idea to make a tremendous difference in the world. And, you know, of course we, we love the fact that we get to tell the story of musical notation and how it came to be and, and you know, the, the origins of teaching music, but equally as important is the theory and the thought that, that one individual can make a difference. Yeah, we've done that a couple of times. We have, yeah. In our books, yeah. What well, something think- your very nose and that each individual can, can make, make a, a difference. difference. No matter how small. Yeah. No, I think that's a great lesson, and I certainly glean that from from reading this this wonderful book. Um, your book also shares that Guido turned down the opportunity to stay in Rome with the Pope and teach the Roman clergy. Well, teach everybody in Rome that was interested. I mean, he, the Pope begged him to stay, but um, he probably uh, probably had some ill health issues. We don't actually, we don't know for a fact the real reason why he chose to turn down the Pope's offer. We can, we can, we can guess at it. Some people say that he preferred life in the country, that he preferred the pastoral life that he had created for himself. in Arezzo. Right, right. Um, some people uh, theorize that he might not have been feeling well and the city wasn't very good for his health. Um, there are various different theories about that, but um but, the, but what we do know for a fact is that the Pope did ask him to stay and that he graciously declined and returned to his humble teaching position in Arezzo. So I want to bring this back to kind of your personal experience. So if you think of here's this tremendously, right, he wrote books, he influenced how we all think of music today. Um, and he turned down this amazing opportunity of his life. And we don't know why. Well, the opportunity really was to go to Rome in the first place and teach the Pope himself. And that he did, and the Pope welcomed it. He, he learned how to read music. That's what he wanted to find out. And then, of course, it went all over Europe from there. Then it went viral, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Do either of you have an opportunity that you maybe turned down or didn't quite do or explore fully Um in your personal life or in your professional life. And I mean, for me, it's also this thought that, you know, sometimes when you close a door, a window opens or you've accomplished so much and you, you have to do what you feel is right in your heart. I think that's also one of the, the narratives I feel here. Um, and I wanted to know if either of you had a similar experience. I think it's probably easier to say that I get asked a lot about do I have any advice for young uh, uh, people, well, young and old, do I have any advice for people who are aspiring to be either in the theatre or to sing or to whatever? And I say always to them, because it's what happened to me, is that opportunity could float by past your, on your desk or under your nose or (laughs) float by any day in your life which you never know when that's going to happen and you might not recognize it as an opportunity but the thing that I stress is since you never know when that might happen do your homework be ready and learn your craft as well as you possibly can if you're passionate about it so for me I had the most amazing strokes of good fortune, meeting people, being in the right place at the right time. And one thing stacks on another and another and another. But I don't think there was anything that was an, was there anything that was an enormous setback for you or me? I can't really I mean, think of it. I, I, my experience, if I, that the first thing that jumped into my mind was that I, at a certain point in my 
in my uh, education made a decision to take a leave of absence from college. And, uh, and that was an opportunity that I, ch I chose not to take and have regretted ever since. Um, however, had I not made that decision, I'm not sure other things that did end up happening in my life would have happened. Would I have met my husband? Would we have started the theater that we started together? Would mom and I have started writing together? You know, there are no accidents really in the grand scheme of things. There are only choices and then how you, how you, yeah, and your education was, was, in, it was so much in, in theater and yeah, study. You studied I, in LA, but you just didn't stay through. And college. eventually I went back and I, and I, in much later life pursued my, my degree and my master's. Um, so I was able to close that loop for myself. But I, of course, being a child rat and performing all over England from the age of about 10 years old onwards, I never went to a university or a, a good school. It was always sporadic. And I had a tutor that traveled with me until I was about 15. But after that, I, I, my mother said, oh, you'll have a much better education from life. And to a great extent, I have, but it's taken a long time. It's an incredible answer. Thank you both. Ah. <laughs> well, we're always learning. You never, ever finish learning, do you? No, that's true. Never. That thing never. about opening a door, but the minute you learn one thing, there's another door beyond it that you right. want to find and open. And it's fascinating and and. I don't like it when children say I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me quite not angry, but irritated because there's so much that one can find out about and learn about. And it's just capturing their imaginations and pushing them in the right direction. Beautifully said. Well, for those people out there just joining us, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You're watching PBS Books, and it is my pleasure to be here with legendary Julie Andrews and award-winning writer Emma Walton Hamilton, authors of The First Notes, The Story of Do, Re, Me. Back to the conversation. So I would love if you would share a little bit about an important passage. Um, maybe read if you could read a little bit or read a page to share with everyone. Absolutely. Like, do you want to start with the actual yeah, opening? I, which... No, let's let's uh, go to the page that we selected, which is um, this is the page when after Guido has been told, as we've talked about, by the other monks in the abbey that he should spend more time praying and less time being creative. Uh, he's very discouraged. And he leaves the abbey. He gets offered a job in a, in a different town, in the town of Arezzo, teaching. And he's been very discouraged. And music has eluded him for quite some time because of his sadness. And, and his setback. Yeah. And his setback. And, and this page is the page where he rediscovers music in, his, in its joy in his life. And um, as mom reads it, I would just love to draw your attention to um, what we tried to do here, which was to allude to the musicality in nature and the way in which the sounds of music, uh, no pun intended, uh, surround us every day, everywhere we are, yeah. and, and specifically Guido. And Not music. just music, but music made by, well, I should read. Should yeah. I read? Read. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> the whole thing? Just this page. Right. Guido left Pomposa and began the journey to his new home. The sun warmed his back, songbirds twittered, and the clip-clopping of his donkey's hooves made a happy rhythm as he jogged along. A breeze whispered through the olive trees, and the tall cypresses stood to attention. Guido began to hum, and then to sing. And Heather, I would love to just draw um, our, our viewers' attention. I, can we just go back to the illustration for one second? Um, if you can see Guido singing there, you can see some little red squares that are floating up from yeah, his that's mouth. that's something we should have mentioned. And those are the musical notes. So in Guido, what our wonderful illustrator Chiara Fidele did was she chose to take the idea of musical notation, the way in which Guido wrote notes in those days were by making little squares, not the musical ovals that we use today. And she took that concept of 
musical notation and these squares to indicate music wherever it appears in the book. So you will notice as you're reading the book that when people are singing, when birds are singing, when music is being made in any form, you'll see these little ripples of, of red squares floating up to indicate the sound of music. I do like the red squares and I like that they're throughout the book. It's a really fun um, touch. I actually, it's funny because my next question was about the illustrator. And I know that authors often have different relationships with their illustrators. And so I was curious about your role in the process. Um, were you involved at all in the, the selection of the illustrator and did you see mock-ups along the way? Yes, very yes. much so. We are very fortunate. We should point out that um, the, the norm in children's publishing, particularly in picture book, um, which comes as a great surprise to people often who don't know uh, the ins and outs of children's publishing, the norm is that there is no communication or very little communication between authors and illustrators um, in the picture book world. Yeah. The editor and the art director serve as the intermediary between the two so as to preserve the creative autonomy of both. Um, we've been and very sometimes fortunate. we've been very, very fortunate. Yeah. Sometimes authors don't even get a say in the choice of the illustrator. Fortunately, in our case, um, this was a, a, a decision to, to invite Chiara, to ask Chiara if she would be kind enough to illustrate was a, a decision made in partnership with our editor at Little Brown, the wonderful Andrea Spooner and, um, and her art director. And we looked at a number of illustration possibilities and illustrators portfolios. And we just were so drawn to Chiara um, we loved the fact, of course, that she was Italian and we felt that, that was a great asset that she would bring. But also she has such a wonderful affinity to uh, to be able to capture everything from nature that we wanted to be able to celebrate to um, to historic buildings, to uh, faces and features and, of characters. And those were all important to us. And uh, she she hit the, she hit the mark every step of the way. We did send her once she was identified and, and signed on. We did send her a great deal of research. Uh, we sent her, you know, various different bits and pieces that we had collected throughout our research of what we knew Guido to look mm -hmm. like, uh, what we knew the Abbey to look like, and and so forth. And then of course she she was very faithful but to us to our publishers, and it was a beautiful collaboration all around and and she went to Pomposa Abbey and yeah. she uh, she did met, her homework as the, well uh, the head of what, the, the Abbey the yeah. museum directorate yeah yeah wow um I do want to point out that right here you even on the inside of the the spread in that beautiful circle it actually tells you even I mean it's a it's a gorgeous book and it tells you what it was painted on, the type of paper, watercolor gouache, colored pencils. I mean, in so many ways, it's um, it's a work of art in itself, not only the words, but also her beautiful uh, illustration. Also, I love the fact that if you open the front and open the whole thing, which is just a second, wide like that, that is the entire painting that you did for the front and back. And then there are some wonderful end pages that Actually, yeah. for, for the end papers, she chose to use the uh, mosaic floor tiles of the main um, cathedral abbey. in the yeah. abbey. Yeah. And she reproduced them here, but she created a game inside them that readers may or may not spot, which is if you look closely, you will see a little deer, a, a spool of thread, um, a, a sun. sun so yeah. there's the game of find the do re mi, do a deer, a female deer. Ray, a drop of golden sun, etc. In the end, and then the actual cover, which we were thrilled about because it wasn't anything that we knew was going to happen, was there are those square notes, and and it's got a kind of linen-y feel to the cover of the main book. Yeah, she did it absolutely. She did us proud, and so did uh, uh, um, Little Brown. Really, I mean, yeah. children's books because they they allowed so much to make the book as pretty and, and interesting as I think it hopefully is. It is, it is. So my next question, I'm interested, the arts are often one of the first things to be cut in a difficult economy. And certainly during the pandemic, um, the arts 
suffered, especially music, right? Because I think early on in the pandemic, oh. there were all of these kids who were singing and they all got COVID and therefore all of a sudden schools thought uh, that that was the number one, one of the number one uh, passers of. Yes, uh, singing, you know, you're opening your mouth and you should be wearing your mask. And... <laughs> right. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to just share a little bit about the importance of music education, because I think this book so much um, is is the story of the importance of music education. I mean, Guido was one of the first music educators. That's right. Uh, well, you are you are speaking our language, Heather. Uh, we are passionate arts advocates and, and advocates for arts education in particular. In every form. And um, and we we often try to spread the word that there is a profound connection between. I mean, this is this is well documented um, through through global surveys and studies that have been put out by organizations like mm -hmm. Americans for the Arts. Right. Um, there's a there's a very powerful connection between arts education and success in later success in school and success in later life. For example, we know that children who participate in, in arts programs uh, regularly are more likely to uh, communicate better in, in later life. They will have better communication skills. They are more likely to be philanthropic. Or to vote. They are more likely to vote. There are all these ripple effects that come from engagement with and exposure to the arts. And yet, much to our dismay, usually the arts are the first budget cut that is applied to all schools. And I do think that librarians themselves do an enormous, wonderful job of keeping things uh, going in terms of the books themselves, but the arts programs Oh, I would love to see them come back in schools more. Yeah, so much more. And, and of course, so music, fun. music in particular, is math. You know, the synergy between the arts and other subjects is, is very important, too. And in, mm. in the case of this book, we have history and music and, and math. And, you know, there's just so much overlap and, and synchronicity there that I think it's really important we, we pay attention to. You must have been a very nice fellow. I think so. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so forms of music notation, they've been identified in archaeological remains in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, Chinese, Greek, and other civilizations. Have you ever considered exploring any other archaeological remains to maybe write another book? Oh, oh well, we, we love doing research. We absolutely love it. <laughs> we wrote a... Um, we wrote a middle grade novel um, several years ago, which is set in medieval times, which we did a tremendous amount of research. Oh, for gosh, yes, well. we did. That's probably the most research we've ever done. Yeah, um, that's a, that was a book called Dragon. That was a novel. novel for, for um, uh, it wasn't necessarily illustrated, was it? Just m a map at the beginning. Yeah, and the jacket cover, of and, course. Yeah, but yeah, we love. Based um, on a true fable. Yep, yeah, we absolutely adore uh, research and writing books that, with a, a historical element that we can incorporate. But that kind of research was huge. I mean, this first notes was pretty big, but honestly, Dragon was, um, what did they eat in those days? What was their armor like in those days? Big difference between one year and the next in terms of... Uh, where did they sleep? Where did, know, they how joust, did they joust? How did they joust? And yeah, all of that. So it, it, it was, was very, um, very important to get it right, you know. Really right. And where was where were the different castles in France and, and, and the who were the lords of the of the country. But it's a lovely story, that one. And I'm I think it was the most research that we've ever done, which happened to be uh, and it fell uh, in our laps to a certain extent. We it needed did, yeah. we needed our young hero, our young protagonist, to have been uh, to have lost his parents and with the most enormous um, uh, joy, we discovered that there was a huge revolution that went on, not the main revolution, but a smaller one, where his parents would have probably been killed and he was sent to live with his, uh, uh, was it uncle? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uncle. But that's another book. That's it's another book altogether. Yeah. But it's that kind of fun to discover. Um, so what are you working on now? Ah, well, we have two other picture books in the pipeline. Um, we have a one coming out next year and another coming out the year after that. Um, one is a one is a picture book that celebrates theater and all things theatrical. Uh, the other is another picture book about 
the power of music, but a very different story, more of a fable, um, with a little bit of a true story inspiration behind, behind yeah, it. Yeah. We're also working on the third installment in Mom's Memoirs. Um, that's huge. That's a big task. Yeah. Yes. And uh, we're working, we're also working on bringing um, a stage adaptation of one of our children's books to life, a, a, a book called The Great American Mousical, which has had some life uh, early on as a, as a stage musical. And, and it's, it's a about charming musical. Developed. Yeah. So as you spoke uh, about your mother's memoirs, it made me think a little bit about some of the, the characters, right? The quintessential maternal characters, Maria and the Sound of Music, Mary Poppins. Um, and I couldn't help but wonder when I knew I could finally speak to, to, to both of you, it, for, for um, Julie, in terms of the, the relationship between your character and did you find that those characters embodied your personal priorities? Um, because in a lot of ways, I think of your love of music, your love of theater, all of those things came out in those characters. I and it's an accumulation of things that, that your life grows and you become more and more enriched. And I think it's probably a little bit of me, obviously, in all the movies, but um, uh, it, the opportunity to, play in them just came across my desk in, in with great good fortune and so it's, I think it's probably I mean when if you think about it when a role is cast in a film or in a stage production they are looking for the, some the perfect person who embodies those qualities of that character it's mostly my enthusiasm isn't it you know <laughs> uh, enthusiasm I always see the glass half full rather well, that's than true half empty that's for sure. <laughs> Well, um, what was it like, Emma, growing up with with your your mother's Mary Poppins? Like, right, what was that like? Was it ever a challenge? Or, I mean, it, it... well, it was it was certainly a challenge when I had to clean my own room and couldn't couldn't <laughs> ask her to snap Poppins. her fingers. You know, <laughs> I mean, why she could do it for them? Couldn't she do it for me? Um, but no, I I am of course I feel enormously blessed. Um, you know, I'm I'm often told by people how much they wish that my mom was their mom when they were growing up and so forth. And so I know but that also I'm, I'm you, the lucky girl. Who you kind of embraced the family tradition and so many theatrical families, the children sometimes go against it because it's, it's meant that they would either not invited in or something like that. But, but in Emma's case, she was so proud that her own dad who has illustrated several books for us, and he very sadly passed away earlier this year. But her own dad did, was the most enormously brilliant theater designer and film designer and book illustrator, and he did some of our books for us. And he, did, he designed Mary Poppins as well. And of course he was the so. designer of Mary Poppins by the absolute freak of great good fortune. But then, you know, my stepfather, of course, was the wonderful film director, and my stepmother is a writer as well, and so, I was she had it all around her and could have chosen surrounded by anything. Arts, yeah. And you started by being an actress. There is a funny story though, which is might be a good one to wrap up with, Heather, and that is that um, when I was about three, Mary Poppins had just come out, and I was uh, with a babysitter, and we were shopping in a in a children's <laughs> section of a department store, <clears throat> and because the movie had just come out, there was a display. And of, uh, Mary of Mary Poppins, and there were all these, you know, promotional display. Obviously, that the, the store was full doing. life figures, and there were all like these that. cardboard cutouts, life size cardboard cutouts of Mary Poppins in the in the store. And I very distinctly remember saying, "There's mommy," and then suddenly being aware of two women standing <laughs> nearby saying, "Isn't that sweet? That little girl thinks her mother is Mary Poppins." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "But." She is. <laughs> okay, a fun question. If you had a Mary Poppins bag, what is one thing, anything that you would make sure you put in it? Put in it or pulled out of it? Oh, pulled out of it. I guess yeah. one thing you'd want to pull out of it. Oh, oh 100 great books. Good answer. I was going to say puppies. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. 
either will either will do very well. That's right. right. Yeah. Those are perfect combinations. Well, on that note, if they have chewed the books inside yeah, the comments, <laughs> very wise. But I'm not surprised at the wise comment comes. <laughs> I want to thank both of you. Um, thank you for your brilliance, your creativity, for taking the time to be with us and be with everyone. Um, we do partner with 1,800 libraries across the country, as well as numerous local PBS stations. But librarians, go. Yes, yeah, yeah. librarians. <laughs> um, most importantly, we want to thank our viewers. Um, but without you, Julia and Emma, sharing your, your ideas with us and the, and the research in the background, we wouldn't be able to have this today. So oh. thank you so much for this time. Thank you for asking us. Yes, it's been a great pleasure. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montia. Happy reading.